This is Laura London, and you're listening to Speaking of Young. Joining us today for episode 116 is physicist Dr. Harold Ottmansbacher from the ETH and the Jung Institute in Zurich, Switzerland. He earned a PhD in physics from the University of Munich in 1985 and spent two years as a Reimar Lust Fellow. He then worked for 13 years as a research scientist at the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics and spent a year on habilitation in theoretical physics, nonlinear dynamics, and complex systems at the University of Potsdam. From 1998 to 2013, he served as head of the Department of Theory and Data Analysis at the Institute for Frontier Areas of Psychology and Mental Health in Freiburg, and from 2002 to 2005 was an associate member of the Max Planck Center for Interdisciplinary Plasma Science. Dr. Ottmansbacher has been on the faculty of the C.G. Jung Institute Zurich since 2004, and a faculty member of the Parmenides Foundation since 2005. In 2007, he became an associate fellow of the Collegium Helveticum at the ETH and the University of Zurich, joined their staff in 2014, and is now an emeritus member of the Turing Center. He currently serves as president of the Society for Mind Matter Research, and is editor-in-chief of their interdisciplinary international journal, Mind and Matter. He is a fellow of the New Institute's The Human Condition in the 21st Century, and is an elected honorary member of the International Association for Analytical Psychology, known as the IAAP. His publications include The Pauli Jung Conjecture and Its Impact Today with Christopher Fuchs, his review of Quantum Approaches to Consciousness in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, and his latest book, Dual Aspect Monism and the Deep Structure of Meaning, with Dean Rickles, published this year by Routledge. Please visit our website, speakingofyoung.com, for links to everything discussed in this episode. This interview is being recorded on Wednesday, November 30th, 2022, through the magic of Skype. Dr. Ottmansbacher, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Laura. It's, it's a great pleasure to be with you today. I'd like to begin by sharing with the listeners how I was introduced to your work. You are not a Jungian analyst. You are a member of their governing body, the IAAP. And I learned of you through Jungian analyst Beverly Zabriskie, who was my guest last year for episode 85. And in preparing for that episode, I watched two roundtable discussions on synchronicity that were filmed at the Helix Center in New York City in 2014. They are available on the Helix Center's YouTube channel. I will put links to them in the show notes on this episode page at speakingofyoung.com. The roundtable consisted of Beverly Zabriskie, Jungian analyst Joseph Cambray, Edgar Chuiri, Farzad Mahutian, and you. Would you tell us a little bit about how you became involved with that fascinating group of individuals? Yeah, I can. As far as I remember, the, I mean, the main um, power behind this was, I think, if I remember correctly, was Beverly uh, and uh, partly also Joe Cambray, which and I, I knew both of them um, maybe two years before the Helix events happened. And so simply what happened was that Beverly probably asked me, just uh, whether I would like to be part of that round table. And um, so since I was in the United States anyway, at that time, it was, it was a clear yes. And I, I met uh, Joe Cambray again. I met Ed Narcessian, the director of the Helix Center, uh, who does these fantastic programs still today, very nice programs. And Edgar Chueri uh, from Princeton, who is who, who, with whom I, I became friends, and who was the um, uh, Farzad Mahutian at uh, Farzad, yeah, Farzad also. Uh, 
all these people, very kind people, very knowledgeable, and then we 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 came into this roundtable discussion with which was pretty lively and interesting. So that was that was great stuff. 2014, you say, was that? Yeah, yeah, and there yeah. are two of them. Yeah, I know. One of them was in the Helix Center, and the other one I think was in in the um, in the medical center of NYU, I think, or some somewhere there. They're fantastic. Uh, all of you have this great discussion, bringing in your perspectives, and then there are Q and A's at the end. And at the time, you had just had your book, uh, the Pauli Jung Conjecture, published. So I was hoping we would start there and for you to tell us a little bit about what the Pauli Jung conjecture is. Yeah, I can do that, of course. Uh, the book was based on talks that people gave on a, on a conference that we had down here in Switzerland. Um, and Beverly was there again. Uh, Joe Camray wasn't there, but he contributed to the book. And uh, Christopher Fuchs was there, a fine colleague from Boston University. And after we heard all the talks at the conference, we decided this should go into a book and then um, be distributed more widely. Uh, and the book got the title, The Pauli Jung Conjecture. So um, the first thing I should maybe explain is what I, what I and we actually meant by the notion of a conjecture. Mm -hmm. Of course, this is... This is, in some sense, also everyday colloquial language, but in mathematics, where this notion is used pretty frequently, it has a very special meaning. A conjecture in mathematics is a plausible hypothesis which is yet unproven. So many hypotheses in mathematics, you just put them and then you prove them, and then they, are, then they go into a theorem, and that's it. But there are some really difficult uh, hypotheses which remain unproven for a long time, decades, sometimes even centuries. Mm. And then these um, hypotheses uh, move up uh, to be a conjecture. So the Goldbach conjecture, the Fermat, Fermat's last theorem, the it's also a conjecture and many others. And some of them are still unproven for several hundred years. The Fermat conjecture, the last theorem of Fermat, was only proven in the back in the 1990s, early 2000s. So this is something that, that, that this is a notion that mathematicians like to use when they want to highlight some some very important um, mathematical theorem, which is not unproven, but it is plausible. It has it it holds. You know, for many examples, but of course, it, this does not mean that it is proven in full generality. Now, the Pauli Jung conjecture, uh, we we sort of abuse this notion of conjecture because of the, because the Pauli Jung uh, framework of thinking is not a mathematical conjecture; it's a philosophical, for, let me say, framework of thinking. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, I think it has some plausibility, and we will probably talk about that in more detail. And it's, it's, of course, not proven in so far that in philosophy, nothing is ever really proven. You can only collect, you know, plausibility. You can collect facts that fit into the framework and you can uh, convince other people to work on it. So that, that's a more, it's more like a, 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 pr a process that increases uh, confidence in philosophy. It's not like in mathematics that you can really prove it for once and ever. I'd like to give the listeners some background uh, as to, I mean, why Pauli and Jung, what was it about the work that they did together that led you hmm. to developing this conjecture? Yeah, so the, as I said, it's a philosophical idea and it is um, a philosophical idea that tries to open a novel perspective, we're talking about the middle of the last century, 1950, mm -hmm. um, 50, 55, something like that. A new perspective on what's often called the mind-body problem or the mind-matter problem. And this problem is um, that we do not really understand how the physical world 
and our mental world, the, the world of our mental constructs, uh, conscious states, and so on and so on, are related to one another. I mean, we know that they are somehow related to one another because we have a brain that is a physical system, mm -hmm. biophysical system, a biochemical system. And uh, we know that all our conscious states, our, our conscious mental states, are somehow correlated with brain states, but it's still up to today. It's unclear um, how these how this correlation really looks in detail. Now, in the history of philosophy, this problem has played a huge role, and in modern philosophy, that starts more or less 400 years ago. Uh, there was this French uh, philosopher René Descartes, and Descartes had this idea that. Um, the world is actually constituted by the physical and by the mental, and they have a kind of sharp delineation. So they are distinct from one another. And of course, also Descartes could not solve how they related, but he put this hypothesis, which is now called interactive dualism, that um, the mental and the physical are the base substances in the world, and they are somehow interacting, don't know why and how. And of course, then there were reactions to this Cartesian position. And the main reactions in the history of philosophy since then were idealism. Idealism would be the thesis that uh, there are not no two substances, there is only one, the mental mind. And somehow the physical emerges from the mental. Don't know how. And then there's the alternative position, which is which has been called materialism for a while. Now people uh, prefer the notion of physicalism. And physicalism would claim that actually there is only one substance, namely the material world, the physical world. And somehow the mental emerges from the physical world, don't know why and how. So these are the three mainstream positions during the history of philosophy, Cartesian dualism, yeah, idealism and, and physicalism. And of course, physicalism still today, I would say, is in the philosophy of science and philosophy of mind, the mainstream position. Now, Pauli and Jung uh, tried to work out an alternative to all these three positions. And that alternative is now called dual aspect monism. It has a long history as well. It goes back uh, also almost 400 years, maybe 350 years to, to Spinoza, the Dutch philosopher. Uh, and there were, you know, between Spinoza and now, there were other people who um, tried to argue that way. Uh, dual aspect monism does not consider the mental and the physical as substances of which reality consists, but um, they, they, um, Dual aspect monism treats the mental and the physical as perspective, as aspects, as it were, of some underlying substance. So dual aspect means two aspects, the mental and the physical. And what then the question, of course, is what are they aspects of? And, and uh, this is the monism part. They are aspect of a reality, aspects of a reality that itself is neither mental nor physical. So it's, in other words, psychophysically neutral. That's the term that Jung and Pauli use a lot. Uh, so we have, we expand the bipartite problem of the mental and the physical and their relations to a tripartite problem, where we have the mental and the physical as aspects of an underlying psychophysically neutral reality, which is the third part of the picture. So we expand the picture to from bipartite to tripartite. And that gives, gives us more room more playground to, to think about the relations between these parts. So was it Spinoza who first came up with that? I, I think so. In, at, at least in modern philosophy, I would say clearly yes. And Spinoza was a direct reaction to Descartes. Mm -hmm. He even uses the same terminology that Descartes used, res cogitans and res extensa for the mental and the physical. But he based both of them on a third part of reality, which for Spinoza, Spinoza was a very religious person, 
although he was excommunicated twice by the Jews and by the Catholics, <laughs> so he, remained, he remained very religious. So for Spinoza, the, the, the third part of reality was immediately, immediately the divine, right? Jung and Pauli were working on this, and it seems like they were working on this behind the scenes, kind of, right? That is true. I mean, Pauli definitely, I mean, Pauli's close collaborators, I mean, there were, there were some very close collaborators who knew what he was doing when, we, when he was talking to Jung, but uh, even his assistants at the university, and not to speak about colleagues and, and students, they, they wouldn't really know what he was doing. And all the knowledge that we have of what Pauli did in this kind of collaboration, we have from his correspondence with Jung, with Marcus Fiertz, with um, people around Jung, and with other uh, very close colleagues. Now, Jung was actually uh, more open about all this. He published uh, in his in his works, uh, um, he, he published what he thought about the, the, um, the Pauli-Jung conjecture. There's one book that actually Jung and Pauli published together, that's um, the interpretation what, what's the exact title? The Interpretation of Psyche and the Interpretation of Nature, something like that, 1952. Uh, and that book has a chapter by Jung on synchronicity and a chapter by Pauli on archetypal ideas in um, the mathematical description of the physical world and the example that Pauli was discussing with Kepler. So that was in the 16th century. So that's more or less uh, the only publication that really tells us something about the collaboration. Every, mostly, uh, most other things were, as you say, behind the scenes somehow. And is it because they were still working on it? They were taking their time and working this through? I mean, Pauli died, I think it was three years before Jung, uh, and yeah. it, it he, he didn't finish. I mean, he didn't finish what he was working on. So what do you what do you say about their body of work together as far as where did where did they leave it? Yeah, I can I, you know I've been educated as a physicist too, so we learn in, in physics we learn that we don't publish something if we really if we don't have real good proof of evidence that it holds water. Mm -hmm. So we would never publish in physics, in physics journals and in physics textbooks, we would never publish something that is uh, still work in progress, let me say. And, and would and you... For yeah. Jung, mm -hmm. I think for Jung this was a little different because, I mean, Jung was publishing many things and you see in his publications over the decades, you see a clear evolution of his ideas, yeah. right? Yeah. For instance, the notion of archetypes crucially changed several times in Jung's writings. And, uh, and this can all be seen in his publications and his works. Um, in, in the sciences, you don't do that. You don't give your reader a sense of the history and all the, the, the convoluted pathways through which you came to the final result. This is almost like microsurgically uh, cut off from what you published. <laughs> it's, it's a very strange thing, but it, this, is, this is really how it is. In the Pauli Jung conjecture, you, as you said, it's a collection of essays, and you mm -hmm. believe that you've uh, covered the work that they did together. I mean, as I said, it was kind of unfinished, right? And then you pick this up in the book that you had published this year with your co-author, Dean Rickles, at the University of Sydney. It is titled Dual Aspect Monism and the Deep Structure of Meaning. Mm -hmm. And there is a section uh, in that book on Jung and Pauli. And you do, um, I, you know, like when there are two authors on a book, I'm not sure who wrote what. And I was assuming that that was you. I don't know... Uh, anything about Dr. Rickles, mm -hmm. you go over Jung's concept of the archetype. Was that you? Yeah, you know, the, the, way, the way in which this book emerged is also a kind of, it has a kind of curious history because okay. maybe I can tell you a little bit about that. Yeah, please. Um, first, uh, you know, I never met Dean before we started working on this project. That's very unusual for me because when I start working together with someone else, 
I, I usually in, in the past, I, I do this only if I know that person, you know, from discussion, I know his background and so on and so on. Now, we were both invited to, um, to a meeting in, at the Stellenbosch in South Africa, Stellenbosch Institute of Advanced Studies. Uh, and this meeting was organized by Chris Fuchs, which, who we both knew. I knew him through this 2014 book. And, and Dean had been collaborating with him before. So we were both invited there, but unfortunately I had to leave before Dean could arrive. So we again didn't meet there. And then nevertheless, we, we had some kind of email conversation and so on and decided that we, we wanted to think about a joint paper about you know putting the Pauli Jung stuff in perspective with other ideas by uh, people like John Wheeler and others. So we started to write something up. I put in 20 pages or 25 pages. Dean put in something like 20 pages. And then this work exploded. So it was pretty clear very soon that this would not be a paper. It would, I mean, if we, if we ever finish that, then it would be a book. And then what we, our writing process was, uh, as you correctly um, assume that uh, so I, I, I wrote a first draft of the Pauli Jung chapter, Dean wrote a first draft of the of the Eddington Wheeler chapter, and then it went, you know, back and forth. I, I you know, added stuff to the to the Wheeler chapter, he added some stuff to the Pauli Jung chapter here and there, and then we made corrections and blah, blah. It's just this, this usual process of refinement of a manuscript. Yeah. Right? But so the Pauli Jung was mainly drafted by myself and uh, Dean did other things, yes. I love what you said about Jung's concept of the archetype, that it's a two-way manifestation, uh, that the archetype is neither yeah. physical nor mental. Would you talk a little yes. bit about that? Yeah, I can. I mean, Jung, when Jung came up with the notion of an archetype, he had, th this was not his idea. When he came up with it, he talked about biological instincts and stuff like that, motivations. So that would be that would be an archetype in an almost physicalist sense, because the archetype would, in the original, in the in the first um, way Jung thought about it, was actually something in the physical world, right? Yeah. And then, and then uh, the first switch in his notion of an archetype happened when he talked about archetypes in combination with mental images, like dream images, stuff like that, mm -hmm. right? And the second switch came when he talked about archetypes with, together with Pauli after Pauli had returned from, from the United States uh, after World War II. And then this collaboration really took on speed, and, and Pauli made clear to Jung that if he, if he wants archetypes, to be the origin, like something like ordering structures for what happens, both in the mental and in the in the physical, then the archetypes themselves cannot be part of the mental, right? So that was something that Pauli made very clear to Jung in, in several letters. And uh, that was, I'm sure, that was one of the, of, of the reasons why Jung really switched together with Pauli mm -hmm. uh, to put the archetypes into a third domain, which is neither the mental nor the physical. And of course, then the question is, how can you, um, how can you know about them? Right. And their answer was, you can only know about them by their manifestations in the physical and in the mental. You say the archetype is part of the psychophysically neutral reality. And I actually I've been doing this podcast for over seven years, and I don't hear a lot of analysts. In fact, I don't hear any uh, speak about the psychophysically <laughs> neutral reality. Yeah, this is really important. So it's really important. Mm -hmm. Yes. So tell us about the and in this book, you you guys go over this in in great detail. The psychophysically neutral as a third domain. That's right. So it's a domain of, re we consider it as a domain of reality. I mean, reality now in capital letters, it's not only the physical reality or something like the mental reality, it's reality in capital letters. And that's the reality that exists independent of the distinction between the mental and the physical, right? right. So everything that's 
that is part of that reality is psychophysically neutral. And uh, this applies to the concept of the archetypes. That's number one. But then also Jung has this notion of the unus mundus, right? Mm -hmm. And the unus mundus would be a kind of limiting concept where all distinctions that you may have between different archetypes also vanishes. So the unus mundus is just literally translated the one world with no distinctions at all. And in order to come to the archetypes, you have, you already have to make the first distinctions, like like um, you know you know the different archetypes that you may have that gives this psychophysically neutral reality structure, and this structure is then conceived by Pauli and Jung as uh, these structures are conceived as the ordering um, elements, the elements that provide order in the physical world and in the mental world. The elements that provide order in the physical world yes. and the mental world. Okay. Right. That's that's the idea. So they are they they um, they are arranging certain things when the archetypes are activated. You know, Jungian analysts often speak about the activation or the constellation of an archetype. And if an archetype is activated in that sense, then it then uh, the way it becomes active is exactly manifesting itself in the mental and in the physical more or less simultaneously. That doesn't mean that we always experience these correlations between the mental and the physical, but they are there. And in some cases where we experience them, the, then we see something that happens in the outside world, in the physical world, and that has a very strange relationship to what we at that moment feel or think. Yeah. And this, this, this relationship is actually what, uh, what refers back to Jung's concept of synchronicity. Right. I would just like to add here, and thank you for saying all of this and for, for writing about it and for your willingness to come on this podcast and talk about it. Because when I created this podcast in 2015, originally, my focus was going to be on synchronicity. And I my intention was mm -hmm. to ask each of my guests at the end, what is synchronicity? Mm -hmm. And why I didn't do that is because around about that time, a movie came out with that title, What is Synchronicity? So, <laughs> right? So I dropped it and a couple of my guests uh, appear in that movie, Christina Becker and uh, J. Gary Sparks. So mm -hmm. I dropped that idea, but I did continue to, to ask my guests about synchronicity and I would never get the same answer. I would never get the same description. <laughs> and <Yes. laughs> I felt that the, the main aspect of synchronicity, which is what you just described, was missing in their explanations. Yeah. A, a, another thing is, and why I'm so interested in it, is because I've noticed it in my life a lot. In fact, mm -hmm. I, I hesitate to say this all the time, every day. Mm. And mm. I would never talk about it because I didn't think anybody would believe me. And I was on the phone with my, with the woman who was my analyst for many, many years. Uh, we still keep in touch. And I said mm -hmm. that to her and she said, yes, it happens all the time. And it's the reason why I, I get so triggered by it is because the, the, the common usage of the word out in society is that it's this special magical thing mm. that makes th this unique thing that that makes you special and and that you should follow it and it's this spiritual uh you know sign from the universe I'm like no this is this is the way reality is and sometimes we yeah. see it and most of the time we don't I, I couldn't agree I couldn't agree more. You know, um, Jung was not totally unresponsible for this um, for this perception of synchronicity as something very, very special and exceptional because he originally related synchronistic experiences to experience to experiences of the numinous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of, of totally existential, you know, uh, grounding and so on and so on. 
and only in 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 later publications or and also in conversations with colleagues like uh, C. A. Meyer, Meyer wrote a very interesting paper uh, that had the title Synchronous uh, No, it was Psychoso Psychosomatics from a Jungian Perspective. And he would say that psychosomatics, this, these are relations between um, our, well, these are bod relations between our bodily constitution and our psychic states. He would argue, Meyer would argue that these are also kind of, you know, kind of synchronicity events, but of course not with numinous content, mm -hmm. right? But structurally, they are. They, it, it's all about the relations between the mental and the physical. Now, and when we came into this and looked at all this material uh, and also looked into the theory of how these different, these three domains, if you want, the mental, the physical, and the psychophysical, control, are related to one another, mm -hmm. then we really saw that actually it's not only about the numinous, it's not only about psyche and soma, there's a whole spectrum, a continuum of different types of synchronicity, which stretch from the numinous, from precognitive dreams, whatever it is, down to, you know, over the the normal psychophysically, um, psychophysical rela relations, until down to, you know, out-of-body experiences, um, automatic writing, sleep paralysis. And so we were able to develop a taxonomy of all these different kinds of psychophysical correlations from the Pauli Jung conjecture. Mm -hmm. And once you have a taxonomy, then of course you are looking for empirical material that can, that can uh, be used oh, to yeah. test whether the taxonomy holds water or not. And that's not an easy thing to do. That's not an easy thing to do because, um, you know, in physics, you just go into a lab, then you build something yeah. up and then you and do your experiments. And at the end of the day, you're done and go home and everything is uh, everything. Either you showed it or not. Mm -hmm. In when as soon as human beings are involved, then, of course, you know, you have to you have to look into what human beings really tell you. And uh, by now we have about close to 3,000 cases of exceptional experiences of, of the kind I just mentioned. And this is a huge empirical um, uh, um, body of material. And um, what we saw in all these, we're doing this for 25 years now, so that just to give you a, an idea about the, about the timeline here. And what we found really also together with other scientists working in Freiburg, Zurich, and also now in the United States, that all these experiences really excellently fit the taxonomy that follows from the model. And that's something, that's something very extraordinary because the whole approach, the Pauli Jung conjecture actually starts as a philosophical undertaking we would say a metaphysical undertaking, then we turn it into a kind of theoretical model that leads us to a taxonomy of experiences. And then we can even stretch it far into the empirical world. So that's something that is very rare to connect philosophical ideas to empirical um, data, if you want. And uh, so we were totally thrilled when, when, when we saw that I mean, all this material, it just falls into these, these four classes that we come up with. Unbelievable. When I read your bio in the intro, I mentioned that you are the president of the Society for Mind Matter Research. Would you tell us a little bit about what that organization does? Yeah, actually, there is a little prehistory to that, too. And that dates back to the time when I was uh, still working in Freiburg in the Institute for Frontiers of Psychology. Um, we had this idea at that time really to come up with a journal, to publish a journal, to first of all establish a journal and then uh, publish it on um, advanced research strategies and research results uh, concerning the mind-body problem. Right. So we did. We, we launched that journal in, in 2003, and after a while, we saw that you know, of course, then you know, doing such a journal needs financial support, and so you need someone who does the copy editing, and you need someone who does uh, who who, who um, overlooks the the, the the refereeing procedure, and so on and so on. And um, 
you can't expect that all these people who are involved do that for free. So we, at some point, we saw that we needed some money to support the journal, and that was the, on the surface, this was the reason to found the society as a as a kind of, ah, okay. um, um, as a kind of institutional body. And then we have members. We have membership fees, which are not expensive, but with the membership fees that we have, we can run the journal. But then also um, we had some new ideas about what else we could offer to our members, right? So we are running workshops for members now once a year, something like that, uh, alternatively in the US and in Europe, so that all, all members, you know, every other year they have a chance to come to these workshops and don't have to travel a lot. And these workshops, this, this special feature of these workshops is that they are a kind of body for for members to discuss even unripe immature ideas which are in the you know just in in the process of coming coming out pro, work in progress something that they wouldn't present at conferences in a kind of protected atmosphere and this has been really a success model you know, we have we have many members really coming to these workshops and that's that's a great thing which we which we didn't really expect when we founded the society, but now it's like it is, and it's it's real fun. And by journal, you mean uh, Mind and Matter? Yes, that's the journal, Mind yes. and Matter. And I will provide links to to all of this in the show notes for this episode oh, that's on Speaking great. Up Young. Yeah, I just wanted to say that that's great. Yes, thank you. And when is the next gathering? I mean, do, does one need to be a member to attend? Yes. Okay. Of course, you know, the mem membership fee is 100 Swiss francs, of, which is, you know, at these times, the Swiss franc and the, the euro and the US dollar are all almost the same. Mm -hmm. So it's $100 for a year. And uh, then what you get is you get, of course, the journal. And you get online access to all back issues, which are now 41 or 42 issues with, with very interesting material. And you also um, are entitled to go to these workshops. The last one was done in combination with the uh, big consciousness conference uh, down in Tucson, Arizona mm -hmm. in April. So we, we get, I mean, this is, it's perfect when you can do, do these workshops as a satellite meeting to another conference, because then the conference organizers can provide space and all the infrastructure is there. Right. And probably we will do the next one uh, sometime um, in 2023, summer 2023 um, in Central Europe. It's not, not defined yet, but we will do that soon. You just mentioned uh, the conference that was held in Tucson, Arizona earlier this year, and I yeah. found out about it, yeah, because your talk uh, and also some additional videos of you are available on YouTube. Uh, you did an interview with a gentleman whose name I can't even begin to pronounce, uh, <laughs> Bruntrup? Yes, I know why. <laughs> Br Bruntrup? <laughs> Yes, Godehard is the first name, Godehard, and the second name is Bruntrup, yes. Yes. And, but also uh, from Munich. <laughs> also from Munich. And yeah. your your entire talk is available, and I want to thank them for recording it and, and uploading it to YouTube. So would you tell us about that conference? It was on consciousness, and that seems to be the big yeah. buzzword right now. And I think it's along with synchronicity, the, the term synchronicity and the term archetype, now the term consciousness is being misused by the general public, uh, very specifically the UFO UAP community. So tell us about the conference on consciousness. So that conference was established in 1994. So the first uh, appearance of the conference was in Tucson in 1994, a very small conference at that mm -hmm. time. And uh, then, then it was organized by Stuart Hameroff, an anesthesiologist at oh, yes. the University of Arizona. Mm -hmm. And uh, at this first conference, also um, people like Dave Chalmers, the name you know. Yeah. Um, then uh, Roger Penrose, who got the Nobel Prize two or three years ago for physics, 
was there and they were just talking about you know how how what what could be done to really understand consciousness in a better way and there's a little bit of history again to this kind of project because um, consciousness was for many decades was completely off the table in all scientific and philosophical discussions you due to the influence of the of the positivists and the behaviorists and so on the behaviorists just said you know what consciousness does is not important for us we consider the brain as an input output system we put something in in the perceptual perceptual uh, cortex and then the motor cortex puts something out and then we are just studying this relation between input and output that's it mm -hmm. now in in 1974, this very influential paper by Tom Nagel came out uh, and had the title, What is it like to be a bat? To be a bat. Strange question. Yeah. It's a strange question. Um, I don't know why he took the bat as an example, but of course he wanted to draw attention uh, to the fact that there is something going on between the input and the output because something has to transfer what comes in to what comes out, right? And he, with this question, what it is like to be a bat, he wanted to point to, uh, uh, point to uh, um, not only that there is something that transforms input to output, but also that it feels somehow to do that transformation, to work consciously on something. Now we can debate about the consciousness of bats, of course, but um, that's the that's that was the main gist of Tom Nagel's paper and Dave Chalmers in uh, 1995, one year after the first Tucson conference, published an article um, with the title, uh, the I think the title was something like the hard problem of consciousness, and that was exactly uh, um, that was a that that really um, that that initiated a whole wave of people. You know, all of a sudden, becoming interested in uh, the the slogan is consciousness and its place in the physical world. The conference now takes place in Tucson every other year in the even years, and in the odd years, it takes place somewhere else. I mean, sometimes in Europe, most often in Europe, I have to say, but also that it was. I think it was in Hong Kong. It was in India once. So some some places outside the U.S. to have uh, to to have uh, to give the to give to people fr from outside America the possibility to to go there as well, right? I'm uh, heard you mention Hameroff, uh, who hmm. is an anesthesiologist at the University of Arizona. You quoted him by saying that that he said, "I know what consciousness is because I'm shutting it off." It, it's funny, isn't it? <laughs> You were talking about, and this is from your interview with Lex Pelger on the Lex Files last year. It's a great interview. I'll provide a link to it in the show notes. Uh, you were mm -hmm. talking about the signals at the synaptic cleft. And I was wondering if you thought that that was something you'd like to discuss right now. I mean, I, I, that's fascinating to me. I know what consciousness is because I'm shutting it off. Yeah, so um, I, I think... I'm, you know, I'm not myself an anesthesiologist, and I'm not a brain scientist. But, but what I know is that many anesthetics act at the synaptic cleft and mm -hmm. just discontinue the the information transport that has to go across the synaptic cleft, really to, to um, get from neuron A to neuron B or something. And if that is disconnected in many synaptic clefts, then consciousness goes away. So that's that's what happens for many anesthetics. Now Stuart had a, and Stuart knows this, Stuart Hameroff, of course, but he had a different idea and that has to do with um, something that people call quantum mechanics in the brain of, or quantum biology. He thought that it might also be possible that anesthetics act at additional places in the brain, not only in the synaptic cleft that connects the, the transport between neurons, mm -hmm. but also in the interior of individual neurons. Okay. And you may have heard the notion of, of microtubuli. Mm -hmm. These are structures, longitudinal structures, within the neurons, which, which enable um, transport processes in the neurons and these um, microtubuli 
have a very interesting structure which makes it in principle possible that they could form something that quantum mechanics people call coherent states. Mm -hmm. And coherent states are states like and entangled states, which are which are something that is actually at the heart of quantum theory. So um, the thesis that he, Stewart and together with Roger Penrose actually what, what they developed was that when these uh, processes, these coherent states, when they happen in the interior of, of individual neurons, then uh, these coherent states can decay into incoherent states. And their hypothesis was then, another conjecture if you want, was then that this decay process of coherent states is something that is correlated with the creation of elementary conscious acts. Now, of course, this is very hard to test empirically mm -hmm. uh, because point one, um, these coherent states decay very quickly, much, much faster than would be required for really something that happens on the time scale of consciousness uh, due to so-called decoherence processes. And then, of course, it's very difficult to look into the interior of individual neurons to see what happens there. It, it, this is empirically a um, very difficult task. So also this hypothesis is still unproven. There are some over the years, they have collected some really interesting um, material. And we know now that um, quantum processes play a role in biological systems, which was in the beginning in, in the 1990s. This was considered almost like complete heresy. Yeah. Now we know uh, that quantum processes are essential for photosynthesis. You know how, how plants mm -hmm. turn light into energy. It, it's also important for the navigation systems of birds. So there are some um, glimpses here and there that that, that uh, delivered some confidence that quantum mechanics may not be so unimportant in living beings. And uh, so uh, Penrose and Hemeroff, they, they still try to do research on this kind of project. And more and more, I think they, they, they move into into the radar of what other neuroscientists are doing and thinking. So Pauli and Jung were truly ahead of their time, um, what they were working on in the late 40s yeah. and early 50s. Yeah, very much so. Mm -hmm. Oh, Eccles and Psychons. Please tell, us a, and tell us a little bit about yeah, the mental particles that interfere with the physical world. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> so Please. Sir, Sir John Eccles, he was another Nobel Prize winner. I, actually, I don't remember what exactly he got this prize for, but it was in physiology and medicine. And Eccles took actually together with Karl Popper, the philosopher, mm -hmm. he uh, came up with, a, with the idea. There's this um, famous book that they wrote together, the, the the brain and its mind or something like that. I forgot the title. They came up with, that, with this idea that, again, consciousness uh, is created somehow or, or depends on processes at synapses, at synaptic transport processes. And um, Eccles came up with a calculation together with a, a German physicist, Friedrich Beck, uh, and they... Uh, Sort of estimated certain energy processes along the along the synaptic clefts, and then they thought that there might be something like physical quasi particles, which become influenced by, and this is another assumption, mental particles or mental I don't know how to call them, mental elements that they called psychons, exactly as you say, and. Um, and then all of a sudden, and then it goes real very quick. Then they say, yeah. And then the the psychons they bring the the free free will story into the in, into the free will um, aspect into the whole story. And 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 this you know this is, I don't think that many people work on that anymore. And um, it's just too much fantasy for you know when you come from a scientific perspective. Mm -hmm. Psychon, no, they never characterize the properties of the psychons. They never characterize how the interaction should 
actually be look should should look like between the cyclons and these physical quasi particles that which themselves are speculation. So this I think is a is a is a hypothesis which doesn't receive a lot of support right now. <laughs> you know, do you, you never know. Yeah, but do you think it deserves or warrants being picked up and pursued? I mean, since we're all working with limited resources and uh, and limited time and everything, I wouldn't select that as my favorite project. Oh, let me put it I, there. I would. I need to <laughs> you figure would? out. Yeah, I need to figure out okay. how to get. Yeah, yeah. That, okay. That I'm on board. Sign me up. Okay. So there <laughs> is some there. I'm just looking through my notes right now. Um, and there are a couple things that I've left out. And unfortunately, I'm sorry, I left out the concept of meaning, which is key yes, to synchronicity. That's... And it is in the subtitle of your book on dual aspect yeah, monism. Is, uh, I think that deserves some more attention in, in, in this interview here. Yes. Because, I mean, let me, let me put it this way. When, whenever in science someone finds correlations, then the question always is, where do they come from? What is what is the process or the mechanism that generates these correlations? And uh, the typical reflex of a scientist is, uh, when there is a correlation, then there might be a causal background to them. So I see correlations between an event A and then sometime later there's an event B. Then I try to find try to set up a causal model that. Um, we say substantiates the correlations, so um, highlights the substance of the correlation, substantiates them. Now, this often works well in science. So we have the causality and causation is a is a big theme in science. But sometimes it happens that you have correlations which are statistically significant, and you don't find a causal model. What do you do then? Then, then the 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 way out of this situation is you would say, if it's not causal, then it's chance. Sounds a little cheap, but sometimes right. it's really chance. Mm -hmm. But in synchronicity, it's neither causal nor chance. That's the idea in synchronicity. But the connecting uh, substance that substantiates the correlation in synchronicity, that's meaning. That was Jung's brilliant and radical idea. And meaning is an interesting candidate because you want something that connects the physical, not with something else in the physical world, but with the mental. So what you need is a bridge between quantitative uh, structures and qualitative structures. And meaning can, in fact, do that. And so um, meaning is really something when you when you experience synchronicities, you, you experience them because of the meaning that you attribute to the external event with your mental state, right? Right, right. So, and then, so this is one in the book that you that you um, have been friendly enough to mention, uh, we really now go into this issue of meaning in much more detail than um, than you find in any other, you know, uh, treatment of synchronicity, and e even in, in yeah. if when you talk when you when you look into the philosophical literature about meaning, even there the notion is often treated in a very undifferentiated way. We go back to a very important and influential paper by Gottlob Frege, a German philosopher at the end of the nineteenth century, and he distinguishes two different types of meaning. One of them is reference, and the other one is sense. The, the paper has the title on sense and reference. So reference is just the meaning relation between your mental state and what it refers to in the external world. That's why it's called reference, referring. It's mm -hmm. a, a referring relation. And now, but now we we don't have only the mental, the physical. We also have the, the psychophysically neutral. And what connects the psychophysically neutral with the um, with the mental and the physical, that is what Frege means when he says sense. So sense in, in, in like when you say this makes sense, or when you talk about the sense of the sense of life or whatever, this is a this is a different type of meaning 
than um, what we have on the surface between the mental and the physical. And the reason why we call all this the deep structure of meaning is that we have a surface kind of meaning between mental and physical. That's the reference relation. That's what we experience in synchronicity. And we have the deep structure that folds back into the psychophysically neutral, which, which gives us the origin, so to speak, the, uh, the, 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 the connection to the psychophysically neutral, which is responsible for the, the reference relation that we experience as meaning on the surface level. I know this is a little dense, but um, yeah, this is a little tough. Of course, we have to leave we have to leave something open for for readers to buy the book and read it, right? There you go. And it, just <laughs> uh, in, in one sentence, you say uh, when you are referencing the subtitle, it's not the subtitle of the book; it's part of the title. I, I keep thinking it's that really it's an the important sub- part of it. Yes. Yeah, that the yeah. title of the book also contains the notion of meaning. You say because we think that meaning is something that is already there at this deep level yes. of the psychophysically yes. neutral, and then gets explicated when you talk about the relation between the mental and the physical. Exactly, you got it exactly right. Yes, those are your words. Exactly. Yes, yeah. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then um, I something else in the book that I just love is when you mention Jung's last work, Mysterium Conjunctionis, which yes. is volume 14 of his collected works, Mysterium Conjunctionis. Mm-hmm. And it's mm-hmm. in the section of dual aspect monism on Pauli and Jung. Uh, and mm-hmm. the subsection is titled Undus Mundus, Transcendent or Imminent? And in yes. it, you bring up what Jung wrote at the very end of his very last book. That is true. And that relates back to what I said maybe half an hour ago. Yeah. Um, when Pauli and Jung started to talk about the psychophysically neutral, they really talked about it as if it were it were empirically and also experientially completely unaccessible, like shielded away from what we can experience. And we can the only thing that we, we can experience is what, what uh, according to them in the 1950s. Uh, that the, that um, the psychophysically neutral, the archetypes manifest themselves in the mental and the physical world. So that's that's the mental and the physical is the only thing that we can experience. That was their initial um, take on it. Yeah. And that would be um, when you read this title of the section. That would be the idea that the archetype typal and the psychophysically neutral is shielded away as a transcendental realm, unaccessible. Now, what Jung says in 19, when did, when did uh, the uh, Mysterium appear in 1961, probably? I'll look for it while you speak. Yeah, yeah maybe 61, maybe 60. Um, he, at, at the end of this, of this book, he really ex- expands uh, this kind of transcendental discussion of the archetypal domain of the psychophysically um, neutral domain into something that may be accessible, but of course not cognitively, not with our conscious thinking, but with experience. So he says, the, for instance, uh, he distinguishes three different types of conjunctio, and the first one would be would be about the experience of the archetypal level, the direct experience of the archetypal level as a correlation between what we experience as our mental domain in our thinking and feeling and the archetypal level itself. So this is a major step forward and, and um, philosophers like Deleuze have called this um, this whole idea and the idea of immanence as opposed to transcendence. So when the archetypal level becomes immanent, then it can be accessed, but of course not in, in, in a kind of cognitive and discursive way, because 
the deeper you go into the archetypal level, the less distinctions there are. And if there is no distinction left, there is no, then you reach the domain of the ineffable, of the unspeakable somehow. Mm -hmm. And still Jung says, this can be experienced. What a fantastic idea. Yeah. When you reference uh, Mysterium Conjunctionis, um, you're referencing the 1963 edition, um, probably ah. the translation. So uh, Jung passed away in 1961. Mm -hmm. So That's right, yeah. Yeah, and, and I, I love how you described it. It was in the very last sentences of his very last book. Yeah, and this is, we pick up on this idea of, of relationships, imminent relationships to the archetypal level in, in a later chapter. You know, we have this chapter, I think, just let me check out the book here. Sure. Uh, chapter 7 mm -hmm. has the title Ideas for Future Research. Yes. Mm -hmm. And in, in one of the sections in this chapter, we pick up on this idea of imminent experiences. Chapter, it's, it's section 7.5 has the title From Correlation to Conjunctio. And um, here we open up a discussion which is, I mean, I guess neither by Jungians nor by anybody else, philosophy or whatever, uh, actually has been started. And this is really relate the uh, tripartite system of correlations which are which are reference correlations on the surface and sense correlations in their deep structure and putting that in contact to Jung's ideas of conjunctio, all three of them. Jung has this uh, first stage conjunctio, which I just um, mentioned before, and then there's also a second and a third type, and these all fit into the picture, uh, into the tripart picture of the dual aspect monist structure of reality with capital letters. So that's something to be work, worked out for the future. I mean, it, it's there's so many interesting things to do which follow from this conject from this Pauli Jung conjecture mm -hmm. that it is. I can't imagine that you know what was. Let me put it the other way. I can imagine if I if I were given another hundred years, I would still working on yes. would still be working. Yes. The consequences for science and for mm. our behavior in society. We will end mm. on that. If you oh, yeah. have some words for us. That relates a little bit to, um, to the institution where I'm, um, where I have this fellowship right now, the, the new institute in Hamburg. Yes. Tell us because about that. that. Yeah. That institute was actually founded by an entrepreneur who is uh, who runs a shipping company, and at some point in his career, he um, found it boring to just make more money, mm -hmm. and so he decided to use part of his wealth to really uh, um, establish this institute and uh, invite people, fellows, scientists, artists, journalists, uh, political activists, whatever, to work together on. And now the, the phrase is a little bit. Um, banal maybe, uh, to make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. However, you know, they do this and there are some project, projects really going on right now. And one of them that we also address in the book in, the, in one of the final sections, uh, that is, that has, the, that has the catchword deep ecology. Right, yes. And deep ecology is a notion that came up in the 1970s uh, and it was coined by a Norwegian philosopher, not well known at the time. And he, uh, Arne Nes is the name, N A E W -S, S. And he published a paper in, in, a, philosoph in a philosophical journal with the title Spinoza and Ecology. So, does that ring a bell? Of course it rings. <laughs> sure. Because he, he, he tries to relate Spinoza's thinking to a kind of ecology that is not only trying to cure the symptoms, but go back to the, to the causes of the disease. Mm -hmm. And that, that immediately rings the bell of a deep structure, right? Yeah. And, and what we are now uh, here in this institute 
trying to do is also um, not directly from the Jungian point of view, but of course all these Jungian and Pauli Jung ideas go into that to really work out how such a deep ecology, ecology um, could um, could look in more detail. You know what what which topics would have to be covered. So maybe to work out a kind of curriculum that might be uh, interesting for academics, but also maybe for school kids or for stakeholders, for policymakers, for whatever. So it would have to be a curriculum that can be, that is flexible enough to to um, target different uh, groups in society. And so this is, this is, in my work, this is, this is a completely new turn and I'm really, um, I'm totally excited by it. <laughs> and you're excited about the work. Yes. And it's called the New Institute and they have a beautiful website. I'll provide a link to yeah. it in the show notes. Yeah. And yes. uh, that's what, you, what you're working on now. That's what I'm working on right now. And of course, this all has to do with the, with, with the Pauli Jung conjecture still. And um, so the broader, you know, let's say the broader framework of, what I plan to do in the years that I, I, I'm, I'm getting left, mm -hmm. that's, that's probably, you know, as long as I can, um, you know, working on these open problems and future prospects and ideas. Yes. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Ottmann-Spacher. I know you're uh, in Germany and you're working and I uh, really appreciate the time that you've given us here today to discuss your work. Yes, thank you very much, Laura. This was this was a great pleasure. And um, whenever I can do the next session with you, I'm happy to do so. Oh, wonderful. I look forward to it. Please visit our website. <laughs> Please visit our website, speakingofyoung.com, for more information on everything that was discussed in this episode. There you will also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast, which are available to stream or to download for free, commercial free. This podcast is also available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, and on my YouTube channel, Jungian Laura. With special thanks to Routledge, to Beverly Zabriskie, and to Frank McMillan, I'm Laura London, and you've been listening to Speaking of Jung.